Everyone, how are you doing this morning? Take out your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy. And uh, we're coming to the end of chapter 3. So chapter 3, actually, though, we're not going to finish the chapter. We're going to get through half a verse this morning. How about that? Um, so turn in there, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16a. How about that? If you're online and you're watching us, we're glad that you've invited us into your living room this morning. There are various platforms, of course. Some of them you could be interacting with us. We'd love that. Please do that. And if you need prayer, there's a number at the bottom. Please contact us. We'd love to be here, and we are here for you for prayer or anything else. So hopefully you're there now in 2 Timothy, and let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the things we've been learning through this series, Faith Full. And what could help us and build up our faith more than the Word of God? <laughs> and that's what we're looking at this morning. What the Word of God brings to us, what it entails, what it holds, how it impacts us. And Lord, we always talk about how important the Bible is and the Scriptures, but that's what we're delving into this morning, looking at it more precisely, because we really do need to understand these truths and live by them, because the world is seeking to tear away, little by little, the truth of your Word. Of course, they can't do that. The truth stands and remains. But Lord, we want to be those that then cling to it. So we pray that we would have a faith full because we're full of your word. Uh, the Bible tells us that, that we might be in your word, that we might be richly blessed, and that's our desire. So bless our time in the scriptures this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, and as always, we say amen. So here we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, as I said, just looking at one verse this morning in our series entitled Faith Full. Looking at the Bible. Um, story is told of a South Sea Islander who proudly displayed his Bible to an American soldier during World War II. The soldier said to the native, the Bible, we've outgrown that thing in the States, to which the native smiled and said, well, it's a good thing we haven't, because if it weren't for this book, you'd be my meal by now. Yeah, that was uh, a man that was transformed by God's word. And that's what the word of God does. It transforms our lives. In fact, it's been said that uh, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to a person whose life isn't. Amen? Because we're in it. So that's what we want to talk about today. In fact, we're just going to look at one half of a verse, but I want to read verses 16 through 17, first of all. So follow along as I read. We read here all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now this morning, and of course we have uh, the message title there, we're going to be looking at the inspiration and the sufficiency of Scripture. And of course that will be our outline. I don't know if they put sub points there for you. Did they do that? Are there some? Okay, there's not. So you're going to be taking some, some points, uh, I mean some notes, and I'll give you some sub points as we move through here. But as we look at the first part here, notice it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The first word that jumps out to me is the word all. In other words, not just, not part of it, not most of it, all of it. That would be the historical parts, the poetical parts, the prophetical parts, the doctrinal parts. There are those who, believe it or not, would love to twist this passage ever so slightly as to say all scripture given by God is by inspiration. Opening up the door that perhaps some of them are not from God. But it tells us here that all Scripture is given by God. And so the doctrine of inspiration is so essential to our faith. You see, if not all of God's word is true, then if you just have one bit that say, well, that's not really not God's word, then it's all not God's word. Because then what parts are true and what parts are, are false? And, and then it becomes subjective to you as to what you like and don't like. But we're told here that all Scripture but isn't this something that Satan did from the very beginning? If you remember in the garden, Satan comes to Eve and says this. Has God indeed said? In other words, are you sure God said that? Are you really sure that's God's word? So Satan works hard to chip away at God's word because he knows that men are set free by it. And of course, this is the key word we want to look at. All scripture is given by inspiration. 
inspiration of God. Theopneustos. Theo, of course, means God. Panuo means uh, breath. So the literal translation would be this. All scripture is given and is God breathed. God breathed. So think about this. God, it tells us in Genesis, breathed into Adam and he became a living being. God breathed truth into the scriptures and they are alive. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and powerful. Now, when most people hear the word inspiration, they think of someone who has some talent or intellect that's been heightened and demonstrated maybe in the works of their hands. You know, they might see a piece of art and say, well, that's truly inspired. Or hear of an author like William Shakespeare and say, truly, that is inspired. That's literary genius. But God's word is not the result of human genius. It is God breathed. Now, did God use human authors as to the vehicle to communicate this truth? Absolutely. However, when they did so, they were used by the Holy Spirit. In fact, you might want to jot down 2 Peter 1.21. It says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, how did God do this? Well, outside of a few instances where God actually gave dictation, we, don't, we know that he gave dictation to Moses when he was on Mount Sinai, right? Moses, here we go, you know. But for the most part, God didn't say to David when he was you know, writing the Psalms, now David, get your pen out, Psalm 8. Oh, Lord, I, Lord. Okay, oh, Lord, how excellent is your name. No, that's not what he did. When Paul wrote his letters to the churches, he didn't hear an audible voice telling him what to write. He simply, listen, he simply was writing to the churches of his concerns that they were going through at the time, but all the time, God was sovereignly overseeing every word he penned. And so, Paul didn't hear an audible voice, nor did actually God take control of his hand. Did you know that there is something today called spirit writing? There are some people who will say, well, I I take dictation, and the Spirit tells me what to write. Well, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's a demon. And they have these writings, all kinds of different things that they say they're inspired to write. But the Holy Spirit did not do that. He didn't take, you know, Paul take a quill and put in the ink and then start writing, and his hands were out, you know, being controlled by the Holy Spirit. No, God actually taught truth through his mind and through the minds of all the other writers and their personalities and their emotions as human instruments, yet at the same time controlled every word they wrote. Warren Wiersbe writes, in his preparation of men, in his guiding of history, and in his working through the Spirit, God brought forth the miracle. That's really what it is, the miracle of the Scriptures. And so the Bible is not a collection of human, human wisdom and insights. In fact, listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.13. He said, the things we speak are not words of men's wisdom, but what the Holy Spirit teaches. Now, think about this. The things that are written here are just incredible. And, And when we read them, it just blows our mind. Now, if you're not born again, sometimes they're like, well, I don't understand this. But once a person it opens their heart and mind to God himself, all of a sudden this becomes a powerful, potent book. Paul wrote in Galatians 1.11, I make known to you the gospel that was preached to me, not through the vehicle of man, not according to man. Neither was it taught it through man, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so in a supernatural way, though the writers of the scriptures, when they wrote, were expressing what they were going through with their own personalities and so forth and their thoughts, the Holy Spirit took those things captive and God breathed his truth. I mean, take, for example, just the disciples. I mean, when we read them, we, we so track with the disciples because they, they, they said and did many bonehead things, right? I, I can track with all of them when they made mistakes, But Jesus then said to them, listen, they wouldn't remember everything, but Jesus said this in John 4, 26. I mean, some of the disciples wrote scripture. And he said, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's gonna teach you all things, and he's gonna bring to remembrance everything I said. Otherwise, they they wouldn't have been able to remember all those details. The Holy Spirit helped them. 
Now, what I want to do is, and this is where I said I'm going to give you some subpoints, because we're talking about the inspiration of Scripture, I want to give you five subpoints to the inspiration of Scripture that are very vital, very important. You've probably heard some of these before. The first would be the word infallible. We say that the Word of God is infallible. That means incapable of error. So when we talk about it, we talk about the fact that it is flawless. In Psalm 19, 7, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect. So think about this. So much so that though the Bible itself does not claim to be a book on science or history or geography, but when the Bible touches on those issues, it is flawless. In other words, concerning all things, its content is impeccably consummate. For example, uh, long before man understood the hydrological cycle of how rain and so forth works, the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, which we're currently studying right now in the middle of the week, Job 36 says, he draws up the waters, he distills them in the mist, the clouds come down and drop them to be abundant for man. He understood through the inspiration of scripture, now what we understand is the hydrological cycle. Or how about this? Men believed up until the 15th century, the world was flat. Everybody, all the writings, the world is flat. Well, thousands of years before that, in the Bible, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 40 and verse 21 says, have you not known, have you not heard? Don't you understand that from the foundations of the earth that he who sits above the circle of the earth. Man, if those guys would have just read their Bibles, they would understand the planet is round. So no matter what subject we touch on, the Bible is always infallible. There's another truth. It's, it's a geological term. It's called isotasy. And it speaks of what is called the balance of our planet. I probably just, you know, messed up that word for those of you who study that, especially here with NASA. But it's the principle that equal weights must be within the earth so that it doesn't wobble or fly out of orbit. In other words, land masses must align in order for us to have an orb that stays in its orbit and stays on its axis and so forth. Well, though we've only discovered this principle within the last 50 years, the Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 12, God has measured the waters. He has measured the, ha- the heavens with a span. He's calculated the dust in measure. He's weighed the mountains on scales and even the hills in balance. In other words, God has weighed out everything, the waters, the mountains, everything, so that there is perfect balance to this geode we call earth. Or how about another one concerning history? For years and years, people tried to disprove the Bible, the gospel, because there was no actual account in writing or anything of a Pontius Pilate who was over Judea. But it was about 50 years ago now, along Caesarea, along by the sea, and we go there on our trips to Israel, there was found a dedication stone, and on it it says, Prefect Pilate, Prefect of Judea. There it is. So it's been said that every single time a shovel goes into the ground of Israel, another lie about the Bible is buried. How true that is. So over and over again, whether it's archaeology, uh, geography, or history, it's always proven fact through the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is infallible. Secondly, the second point we would say is this, is the Bible is inerrant. The word inerrant means it's without error in its parts. So when we talk about infallibility, we're talking about its total content. When we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about the very parts, every little part about it. In other words, when men were moved in inspiration to write the scriptures, they weren't 90% moved by the Holy Spirit or 99%, but it was 100%. The writers themselves testify 4,000 times in the scriptures that the very words, not the content or idea, but the very words were not their own. Proverbs 30 and verse 5 says, every word of God is pure. You see, there are, like, there are people who would like to tell us, listen, these are liberals within even supposed Christianity, who would like to tell us that the main parts of Scripture are inspired, but not every word. Well, I got to tell you, just from a purely logical perspective, to discount the words of a passage is to discount the meaning of the passage. I mean, to say that you, uh, you uh, say the overall content is inspired, but not the very words, that's a problem. 
Why? Well, because we communicate truth through words, individual words that we put together. That's like saying that uh, you like the music of a song, but not the individual notes. Hello. I mean, if you've got a song written and one of the notes is wrong, you hear it. That happens every once in a while in worship, right? I used to lead worship for many, many years. Every once in a while you hit a wrong note, you're looking for people to go, you know. But here's the, why that's important. Because the moment you start determining what words are words are not in a passage, what words are not inspired of God, then you make man the final authority. And in time, when man is the final authority, he'll start tossing out truths that he doesn't agree with because he doesn't want to change his flesh, right? But Jesus testified every word matters, every word. In fact, beyond that, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot or tittle will pass away. Well, what's that? Well, a jot would be our English equivalent to an apostrophe, and a tittle is actually a little mark, a hyphen mark, that distinguishes certain Jewish letters. So not only are the very words of God inspired, so is every jot and tittle. Or we might say the dot over the I and the crossing of the T. How about that? That's why I'll often do word, we call it word studies. Right? I just did one on the word inspiration. I told you what the word means in the original language. Why? Because there's power in the very word itself. Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah says, your word was found. Not the main thoughts, but the word was found, and I ate it. And your word was to me the joy of my heart. And then I think about Jesus' first statement to Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness. You know, what did he say? He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word is inspired. So it's infallible in its content. It's inerrant to every word. Number three, it's complete. Because it's inspired, it's complete. God is not adding any more to the scriptures. There are those who believe, or they may not say the term, but this is what they're doing. They believe in existential inspiration. And that's when you got a preacher who's walking on stage and goes, I got a word from God. I got to give you this word. This is from God himself. Oh, that's a very dangerous thing. You, you can maybe say, I sense God is saying that we need to align ourselves to a past or something. But when you use that and you start bringing other truth and putting it on the same level of God's word, that is very dangerous. That's how the cults operate. Mormonism operates that way. That way. Oh, we have the Bible, but God gave Joseph Smith a revelation. And now we have the pearl of great price put on the same level of the scriptures. Or Christian scientists do the same thing with the book Science, Health, and a Key to the Scriptures. But, you know, this existential revelation. What does God say about additions? Well, in Revelation 22, this is what God says. We're at the end of the book of the Bible, and God just puts one more word out there for us. He says this in Revelation 22, 18. If anyone adds to this book, God will add to him the plagues in the book. Ooh. If anyone takes away any of the words in this book, God will take away his name from the book of life. So here's the thing. You don't want to be adding or subtracting from God's word, right? So we'll often use this term, the canon of Scripture is closed. Now, what does that mean, the canon? You know, is that what it means? No. Uh, a canon from the, the old word, uh, from, from canon, and it's with a K, and, and it was a rod or a reed. And reeds in ancient times were used to measure, a unit of measure. The word over time became to metaphorically speak of a correct standard. In literature, it would be used to speak of correctly attributed works. Concerning the Bible, it refers to the completed lists of book that make up the volume known as the Bible. So the canon of Scripture is complete. God is not giving us new revelation. Let me give you one more example. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to book of Jude. I just want to challenge you all. Let's go to Jude, second to the last book of the Bible, but really small. It's like a postcard, really. It, doesn't, it just got one chapter. But I want to look at one verse here. 
And it's Jude chapter, or Jude chapter one, verse three. Jude three. And Jude says this, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary. I need to write to you. I need to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith. Notice the definite article. It's not contend for faith, the faith we have, but contend for the faith. He was telling his readers that we contend to the faith, and what he's referring to is the full composite of what God has given us in the Scriptures. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the faith. It's everything that we have contained in the Scriptures. And he says this then, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. God's word is complete, once and for all, delivered to the church. Now you go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. And there's a fourth thing. Because God's word is inspired, not only is the canon of scripture complete, but God's word is authoritative. That's the fourth word, authoritative. Isaiah 1.2, and we find this in many other passages. It says, hear, O Lord, for God has spoken. And listen, when God speaks, we ought to be listening because he is the final authority. Why? John 17, 17. His word is truth. So this book, like no other book, can change a person's life. Why? Well, because it holds within it life and death. I mean, there are many books that can change a person's thinking, right? This is the only book that can change a person's nature. It's It's revolutionary. It can change us from the inside out. And I'll tell you what, because of that, Satan works hard to attack it. He loves shooting arrows of doubt to even believers to get them to question the veracity as well as the authority of Scripture. Why? Because if you just question one part of the Bible, he to compromise another part and another part, and then you begin to compromise your life because our life is built on this truth. And so we must trust in God that it is completely authoritative as truth. And when we do, when we we understand that this has full authority, it changes your whole life. Let me give you an example of someone we know well of, Billy Graham. Billy Graham spoke of that. He, He said this, and of course he's now with Jesus, but he said this. When I started to accept the Bible as authoritative, I found out that immediately I had a flame in my hand. And that flame began to melt away unbelief in the hearts of many people to make decisions for Christ. I found that I did not need to rely on cleverness or oratory or psychological manipulation or apt illustrations or striking quotations. I just began to rely more and more on the scriptures and God blessed it, end quote. That's a good word from a man who who was a preacher. He said, I I just got to give the scripture because the more Bible I can get out, the more power it has. It's authoritative. Again, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful, and it goes on to say, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even between the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It gets to the heart of the matter, right? Which is the heart of the problem, our hearts. That's authority. And then number five, one last thing. Why don't you turn to Isaiah chapter 55? So make a hard left, about midway in your Bible, Isaiah 55. And our fifth point you want to write down here is this. Because the word of God is inspired, it's effective. Because it has authority, it's effective. Because of all the other points made up to this point, it's effective. And we see that in Isaiah 55. Uh, Beginning in verse 8, of course, God reminds us, which is so good when we go through difficulty, hey, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Of course, God is infinite. We are finite. But notice the effectiveness now that he speaks of his word. For as the rain comes down, the snow from heaven, it doesn't return there, but it waters the earth and brings forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In other words, I send my rain on the earth and it produces fruit, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing which I send it. In other words, God's word never comes back void. Why? It is always effective every single time. 
This week, I read about a a vacuum cleaner salesman from the 50s. And they used to go door to door, you know, and he was giving this lady a high-pressured sales pitch. And she invited him in, and he said, ma'am, I've got the greatest product, the greatest vacuum cleaner you've ever seen. I'll tell you what, if I even can't control it, the thing will suck up your carpet. And before she could say anything else, he said, ma'am, I want to give you a demonstration. He went over to the fireplace and grabbed some of the ashes and threw them on the rug. And then he had a bag of dirt, and he poured that on the rug, and he says, let me tell you something. You're going to watch this vacuum cleaner suck everything up. And if it doesn't, I'll tell you what, I will grab a spoon, and I will lick it up out of that spoon myself. She looked at him in the eyes and said, well, you better start eating. We ain't got no electricity. (laughs) How horrible to be caught on the spot with a product that won't work. Listen, my friend, that'll never happen with God's word. That'll never happen here. Every time you share the truth, seed truth is deposited into a person's life. Every time. It is always effective. Why? Because it's God's breath. Now let's go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. We see, first of all, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed, right? Therefore, it's infallible. No mistakes in its content. It's inerrant. It's without without any error in every word, even the dots, jot and tittle. It is complete. The canon of scripture is closed. It's authoritative. It contains the words of life and death and can transform a life, and it's effective. It'll always do what God accomplishes it to do. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time just looking at the second thing then in this verse and in our outline, and that's the sufficiency of Scripture. We see the inspiration of Scripture, now the sufficiency of Scripture. Notice he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You say, where do you get that word sufficient? Well, the the Greek word is ophophilimus. It means beneficial, productive, best translation. It is sufficient. It is all sufficient. I would even say it's all sufficient. Why? Well, it comes from God himself. And it's sufficient to meet the need of every believer. Think about this. When Jesus finished his redemptive work at the cross, he said what? Tell Telestai, right? He said, it is finished, paid in full. Our sin's debt was paid in full through the work of Jesus, complete. Nothing more needs to be added, right? Right? In light of that, then, 2 Peter 1, 3 tells us this. Because of that, when you place your faith in Christ, because it was completely done, we have been given all things. That's everything. All things pertaining to life and godliness. That's full sufficiency. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, His grace is sufficient for every situation. Or how about Ephesians 1, 3? We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. All of that is in Christ. That's all sufficient. So think about this. All strength, all wisdom, all comfort, all joy, all peace, all love, all grace, all value, all purpose is all bound up in Christ. So that when you have Christ, or rather Christ has you, you have the all-sufficient one. Christianity is an all-sufficient relationship with an all-sufficient Savior. Do you understand that? Now, where has Christ chosen to communicate that all-sufficiency? It's right here in this book. It's right here. That's where he has chosen to declare that and to manifest that. And so the scriptures tell us that they are all philemas. They are all-sufficient. And I'll tell you what, this is an area that Satan attacks in every single person's life to try and undermine the word of God if you can't undermine the inspiration of scripture he'll try and undermine its sufficiency so that you say yes I I believe that's the word of God yeah I agree I go to church I read my Bible I believe it's God's word but I only believe it's effective enough to minister to certain areas in my life so what you're saying is it's really not all sufficient it's adequate to, to meet certain needs, just maybe spiritual needs, but not every need. And I'll tell you what, when you do that, Satan loves that. He strikes a blow. You see, a lot of times something's going on in our life, and instead of seeking the wisdom of God's word or truth here, are standing on, I, I got to go talk to somebody. I, I got somebody I got to talk to. 
Or maybe it's going through something we're going through now. People are looking, oh, man, we got it. Man, I hope the government gets this together. Man, I'm, man, they got, man, we need relief. The government's got, who, are you looking to government? Are you looking to the government to, to bail us out, help us out and everything? I sure hope not. I sure hope not. I mean, obviously, we elect people there. We got to have organization. But, man, we, our hope is not in the government. Holy smokes. Is, you, is your hope in, the, is the hope in the medical field? Can I remind you that doctors, and we got docs, lots of doctors and nurses here. You know what? They will tell them, I practice medicine. Did you hear that? I practice medicine. We're, we're still trying to work it out. They're still trying to work on this thing. I'm not looking to the medical field to answer all my questions for everything. My eyes are on Jesus. He is the all-sufficient one for everything I go through. Or we're going through a real trial. We, we got to get counseling, man. I got I to find a specialist to help me in my counseling because they need specialized. This is a special field. Now, listen, I'm not discounting that obviously we got to obey our government. I'm not discounting the fact that the medical field is beneficial. You're sick. You go to the hospital or need counseling maybe from time to time. But are we seeking God first? Are we coming to him and are we trusting in him above everything else? I mean, way above everything else because he's the one in control. Is he sufficient? But so many times, Christians turn to the world first. First. Or, yeah, I'm, I'm trusting God, but now i got to get it. But it's, it's like they say it, but then they're really relying on the world. Turn your Bibles to, what, to Psalm 19. Turn to Psalm 19. And I just want you to see this passage. It's so beautiful on the all-sufficiency of Scripture. Psalm 19. It's found in verses uh, 7 through 8. I'll just begin by reading, and then we'll break it down. Psalm 19, beginning of verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, he mentions here six statements that he really uses as synonyms to what the word of God is, the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, the fear of the Lord, the judgments. And then he gives us six statements or different blessings that come as a result of that. So just breaking it down, first of all, he says the law of the Lord. That's, that's God's word. It, it's perfect. We've already talked about that, right? It's flawless. It means there's nothing missing. It's fully comprehensive. It has all wisdom to meet man's need, to guide us, to direct us, to help us. It's all right there. Fully comprehensive. Everything we need for life. In fact, so much so, notice it says it converts the soul. It converts the soul. Is there anything better than the soul that needs change? No. Because Jesus said this, what does it profit a man that he gains the whole world? What if you had all the wisdom, all the money, all the, everything in the world, but you lose your soul? The soul is the most important. Everything else falls underneath that. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be taken care of. So that's powerful. Talk about sufficiency. It changes the greatest need of man. Secondly, the testimony, the testimonies that it gives. Its declarations are sure, which means profitable and trustworthy. So the word of God is a foundation that I can trust for everything. When God says, fear not, I can trust that. When he says, I'll take care of me, I'll be with you, as we sang in that song, we sing it, there's another in the fire, that's taken, right, from Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You get thrown in a situation in the fire, God will be with you. He, he's, that's sure, it's true. In fact, so much so, he says, it makes, makes wise the simple. Now, the word simple literally means, you know, there's probably different ideas that are coming to your mind, but it literally means an open door. One who is simple has an open door. It's, it's someone who receives all things. Oh, I, that's good. I like that advice. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of that, a little bit of this. The smorgasbord of world's wisdom, you know. But God says, that, that's not, he, he, God wants us to be very narrow-minded. Did you know that? When someone says, man, Jesus is the only way, yeah. Jesus said there's a narrow is the way that leads to salvation. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. But it, he'll take worldly wisdom and he'll give uh, worldly wisdom and he'll make you wise for life. Listen to this. Psalm 119. The psalmist says this. Through your commandments, you make me wiser than my enemies. I understand more than all my teachers. You, listen, 
you can go to college and learn from all these professors. They got all these things behind them. Some of you are teachers. Some of you got your own doctors. I get that. You got all those things behind you. But in Christ, God will make you wiser than all that stuff. And he says, I even understand more than the ancients, more than everybody, anybody who's ever lived. How? By attaining and living the life that is according to God's word. There is wisdom. That's how sufficient God's word is. Number three, it says the statutes, which means precepts of the Lord are right. The word means correct. And really, actually, it has the idea of being, uh, getting a person on the right destination or the right path. Again, too many Christians are looking for wisdom in other areas that lead to a wrong destination or a wrong conclusion. They're floating around. Listen, I've said this so many times, but I've seen it happen too many times. Why so I mention it from time to time. Too many people go from counselor to counselor to counselor to counselor to counselor to counselor, whether they're professional or just another Christian, to, to get someone to agree with what they're saying. And then they find, oh, yep, that's right, I agree. Oh, see there, it's right. I found this person who agrees with me. You, anybody can find that. Everybody can. And that's what the world does. But I want to find the truth from God's word. And if I'm not sure where to find it, I want to find someone who's a person of God's word to help guide me and show me where it is in the Bible. And when you find it, notice it says it rejoices the heart. Amen. Number four, the commandment of the Lord. We know the commandments. God, there are many commands in the word of God. Well, they're pure. Bara is the Hebrew word here, and it means clear or clarity. Listen, the word of God is not fuzzy or unclear. It's very straightforward, right? <laughs> That's why sometimes we don't like it. Ooh, I don't like that. It's, it's convicting, right? But listen, it enlightens the eyes. When you finally see maybe your own sin and your eyes go, woo, I didn't realize that was me. Wow. But it's so good because now there can be clarity in your walk in a relationship with God. Number five, the fear of the Lord is clean. Now, we think of fear, of course, as, you know, maybe the present of, presence of imminent danger or something. We get fearful, anxiety. But we also know in the Bible it refers to a reverence of God. Here, David, within these other five statements, is really using it as a synonym of God's word. And he says it's clean. The Hebrew word means free of any imperfection. It's pure. Psalm 12 and verse 26 says, the word of God is purified seven times. And again, it endures forever. So think about this. Man's wisdom comes and goes. We just got to remind ourselves these things, right? Listen, philosophies that were laid out 50 years ago in the United States are totally buried now. Oh, that was a bonehead thought that they did back then. We've got the new philosophy. And the philosophies that we use today and the methods today through man's wisdom, these will be abandoned another 30 years later. Unless the Lord comes, of course, then it'll all be gone. Man's wisdom comes and goes. But God's word remains. Mark 13, 31, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. It endures forever. And then finally, the judgments. Yes, there are judgments that come down from God. And they're true. And they're righteous altogether, right? God tells us it's a standard. This is right. This is wrong. Truth is certainly hard to come by nowadays, isn't it? One soundbite of one politician says one thing. One soundbite of another politician says another thing. We hear all these different voices like, Where do you, who do you believe, right? Because there's so much lying. And it's not just in politics. People lie about their jobs, their schooling, their morality, their values, their thoughts, their intentions. You name it. Even Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? I mean, come on, what is truth, Right? Remember that? Well, God tells us what it is. It's here in his word. It's righteous altogether. In other words, it can lead a person to living a righteous life, a good life, now and before God. Now, because of these statements, because it is so sufficient for our lives, the, the author writes right here, more to be desired, verse 10, are they than gold, than much fine. That's better than anything I could ever find. Sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Man, it does all these things. It converts the soul, makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, enlightens the eyes, endures forever, produces a righteous life. It surpasses earthly pleasures. Verse 11, moreover, on top of that, your servant is warned by them. Thank you, Lord, that you put this here so I can have my life right. And you can convict me because I get off. Everybody gets off. That's why we have the word of God. That's why we gather, to stay right with God. Because in keeping them, there's a great reward. Isn't that cool? One day there's a great reward. What is that? 
Paul called it the crown of righteousness that doesn't fade away. All right, let's jump back to 2 Timothy 3.16 and wind up our time here. Paul says, listen, all Scripture, and I just think this is so important as we're talking about a faithful life, right? Faithful life is having a life that's full of God's Word. And this is why he puts it here. That's why I'm taking the time to break this down because it's so important. Scripture, God's Word is given by inspiration of God is profitable. It's inspired and it's sufficient. Now, there's one more thing that God's Word does, and it's very, very important. We have to come back next week. And we'll finish the rest of this verse in the next one. How's that? It's just a hook to keep you coming back. I want to close with the words of C.H. Spurgeon. He said this over 100 years ago. It's a great word. He said, let those who give up the inspiration of the Bible who can afford to do so, but you and I cannot. Let those who cast away the sure promise of God, who've got something else to comfort them, who can go to their philosophy or turn to their self-conceit. But as for you and me, it is a desperate matter for us if this book be not true. Let us never be afraid of our Bibles. If there is a text of Scripture you dare not meet, humble yourself till you can. I like that. If your creed and Scripture don't agree, cut your creed into pieces, but make it agree with this book. If there is anything in the church to which you belong which is contrary to the inspired word, leave that church. Why? The scripture never errs. <laughs> I love that. I love it. It's right to the point. We need God's word. This is our guide. This is our direction. And we're not worshiping our Bibles. This Bible tells us all about God, so we're worshiping Jesus and how we need that today. Amen? We desperately need this. And so I pray that we, in these days, in these age, we just turn to the scriptures as our guidance, as our directive. And God will get us through. He always does. And when he comes for his church, praise the Lord for that. (laughs) He can't come soon enough for me. Or when he takes my life, when it's ready to go, I'm ready. But I want to live according to his word. Amen.